Amen. All right, let's uh, grab our Bibles tonight and go with me to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. Again, no PowerPoint tonight, so we'll do our very best to get you through these fill-in-the-blanks as easily as possible. Uh, I don't think any of them are, are terribly difficult, so uh, we'll go as slowly as we need to to get it done. Um, as we talked about last week, Revelation 17 is the beginning of the culmination. It's describing the conclusion of what has had its roots in the world since the rebellion of Genesis chapter 11, where the Tower of Babel is described. Genesis 10 describes the leader of that rebellion against God, and that was a man by the name of Nimrod. Um, all false worship finds its inception here in Genesis 11 in the Tower of Babel. So we should not be surprised to find out that this heightens greatly during the seven years of tribulation. Again, false worship, idol worship. Upon the rapture of the church, the restraining force of the Holy Spirit is removed. Okay, there's some strange verbiage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that describes... Only now he who letteth will let until he is taken out of the way. And literally that's talking about the fact that the Holy Spirit is restraining the ultimate, the ultimate sinfulness of the world until he is taken out of the way. And that, of course, is when the rapture takes place. And the Holy Spirit who dwells in us will be raptured out. Now, will he be gone and lost forever? No, he will still have a work, but once again, it will be a different, and this is a good, this is a good Bible word to use. It's called dispensation, all right? There's the Old Testament dispensation. There's the New Testament dispensation. There's the dispensation of Christ and when he was here, and then there's the dispensation of the church age, otherwise known as the age of grace. Once the church is gone, it's a whole different dispensation. Now we're in the end times, the apocalyptic era of, of uh, time itself. And so when the Holy Spirit is removed, um, this false worship obviously is going to escalate quickly and it's going to have a leader. This is the Savior with a small s, the Savior who desires to unite the world into a one-world religion. This will be his initial goal. Okay, now, don't be totally confused by this, but this will be his initial goal. Ultimately, that goal will change when he becomes the Antichrist. Then, he will want everybody to worship him. So then, even... He, the Antichrist, will go against this idol worship. Does that make sense? It's kind of weird. And that's what you're going to see begin to culminate with chapter 17, even though we're not going to quite get there tonight. But that's where chapter 17 leads, that even the Antichrist is going to try to do away with this false worship that started all the way back in Genesis 11. Of course, uh, this all, this one world religion has its base in, of course, you guessed it, idolatry. Idolatry has always been anti-God. It has many chords running through it where there is a simplicity with the gospel, a simplicity with God, I think, really, False worship is not quite that way. It's, it's complicated. Why? Because its roots are based 
on humans who feel and act differently and have different personalities and different desires almost on any given day. So again, it has many chords running through it. A few of those, though. Sexual immorality, humanism, materialism, and secularism, as well as pantheism. Pantheism, we talked about last week, is the belief that everything is God and God is everything. So as we think about it, basically everything is to be worshipped as one feels and thinks, except for the one true God. And this, of course, takes us immediately back to Acts chapter 17, doesn't it? When Paul is in Rome, or excuse me, he's in Athens, and he sees this row of idols at their, their temple, and he's observing this, and he gets to the end of the row, and they have an idol set up that says, to the unknown God. So what they had done is they had all these idols set up, and then they were like, just in case we missed one, we're going to put an idol up and call it, this one's the unknown God. And Paul, of course, played on that greatly in his preaching on Mars Hill and said, I want to introduce you to the God you don't know. And he began to preach the gospel to him. And by the end of Acts chapter 17, uh, there was the typical gospel reaction. Some, you know, I don't believe that. Some said, eh, I want to hear you again. And a few of them believed uh, after he preached there in Athens about the unknown God. So what John sees written on the forehead of this harlot sums up all this idolatry. Babylon the Great, mother of abominations. And that's what you see in verse 5 of Revelation 17. But here's the deal. One cannot help but see a few things from these verses that we're going to kind of pick apart again and move before we move forward just in just a few minutes. First of all, in verses 3 and 4, we cannot help but see the contrast, all right? So we're going to fill in the blanks here, with starting with the contrast of, or we see in verses 3 and 4, the contrast. So, verse 3 says, He, the angel, one of them who had one of the seven vials of the seven last plagues poured out on the earth, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold, precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So there is then, we immediately see this woman riding on a scarlet beast, but literally that woman is riding on a crimson colored beast. That's that may be an easier way to picture the color of the beast. It's crimson in color. That crimson color reminds us of blood because that is pretty close to the color of most people's blood. Some people's blood are a little redder, but most people's blood is pretty crimson. If you're wondering what color crimson is, there is a football team known as the Crimson Tide. That's the color. Alabama's uh, football color is crimson. So uh, yet, even though that there's this crimson-colored beast, which obviously is going to be quite striking, there are seven heads and ten horns on this beast. So that's not real alluring. There's the contrast. Plus... It's full of the names of blasphemy as well. So this is just an awful thing, even though it would be rather striking to look at. Then according to verse number 4, the woman is clothed in purple. And we note that the color purple purple 
is the biblical color of royalty. So here we are with another contrast. Scarlet, of course, crimson, and the other color worn and, and is adorned within gold, precious stones, and pearl jewelry. She is holding a golden cup in her hand. All right? I, uh, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, maybe last week, uh, where we talked about the Fixer Upper shows, and, and uh, uh, Joanna Gaines always has a cup of coffee in her hand in almost every scene. That woman must mainline caffeine. Because just about every scene, she's got a cup of coffee. She's like Gibbs on NCIS. I mean, she's always got some cup. Well, this cup that's in the hand of the beast is going to be golden in nature. Yet, this cup is full, verse 4 says, of abominations. A-B-O-M-I-N-A-T-I-O-N-S. Abominations. If you have trouble with that, it's also there in verse 4. So there's the contrast again. And this cup full of de uh, abominations denotes idolatry and other inherently evil things like fornication, lying, murder, and deceit. All of these things are going to be wrapped up in the character of this scarlet-covered uh, uh, the woman that's riding on this scarlet-colored beast. Okay? So then we move to verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon, the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and Abominations of the Earth. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking of probably the same thing that I'm thinking. Why is that all in caps? Does your Bible have that all in caps? Does anybody have an idea why that's all in caps? Because I don't. It's important. <laughs> that's that's going to definitely, so it'll stand out. Um, any, any other thoughts? It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's out there. It's in your face. Um, I'm not sure, I, no, none of the commentaries I was reading or anything really had anything to say about the all caps. I can just assume that you guys are right on the money. And uh, I'll continue to search. If I ever find anything that's a little bit more exciting, then I'll let you know. But obviously, I think that, yes, it's emphasized because this is something that's been around forever. And it's a mystery. It's, it, to me, it's a mystery that, that it's still around. Remember last week in, in the whole thing that I read to you from our eschatology class, that the false worship even today that that leads into some of the Catholicism um, rites go all the way back and have their roots right back to the Tower of Babel and, and, and all of these different things that have spawned from there. So again, it is a big, bold situation. So again, we see then the name on her crown, okay? The name on her crown, this becomes our big clue as to who and what she is. Remember, this is the woman sitting upon the scarlet-colored beast. The fact that she has this on her forehead or on her crown, the crown that was probably on her forehead becomes the big clue as to what she is, who and what she is. She is the mother or inception of all idolatry. She is the mother or inception of all idolatry. She is authored by Satan to lure people away from God in any way possible authored by satan to lure people away from god in any way possible okay let's go through those three one more time well the name on her crown this becomes our big clue 
as to who and what she is. She is the mother or inception of all idolatry, authored by Satan, she allures people away from God. In this final state, because we are in the Revelation, all right? We're a chapter and a half away now, chapter 19, from the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we are at the final stages of all of this. So, um, in the final state, or in this final state, as shown here in the Revelation, verse 6 says, she is consumed with saints' blood. She is consumed with saints' blood. At this point in time, and remember, the second half of the seven-year tribulation, God has given the keys to Satan, all right? He is in complete control of the earth, and that has been given to him by God for this section of time. And so it is no surprise to us that he would go after anybody that's not going to take his mark, okay? that mark that on, it's on the forehead or the right hand. Anybody that's not going to take that mark is immediately going to be considered an enemy, and anybody that does not take that mark is going to also be assumed as a God follower. And so, there's going to be mass martyrdom in the world during that time, and so she is consumed with saints' blood. Verse 6, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So after all we've seen and read and studied, this actually should come as no surprise because this has been a considered thread running all the way through the revelation basically let's just put it this way the enemy hates those who follow Jesus that's today that's yesterday that is certainly going to be the case in the future that the enemy hates those who follow Jesus he is described right now as our accuser right so he goes before God because he can Get, he can get in the presence of God right now, according to the book of Job, and he accuses us before God. Didn't you see what your so-called son did? Didn't you see that? And Jesus, our great intercessor, mediator, steps in between Satan and God and says, uh, 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 Dad, that son, he's ours. My blood was shed so he can be righteous. And we're thankful for that, but he still remains active as the accuser. Remember, at this point in time, he's been thumped out of heaven. All right? He can't be the accuser anymore because he doesn't have a space with God anymore in heaven. And this also irritates the fire out of him. Right? Because... His goal always is to be God. And so since he can't be God anymore and doesn't have heavenly access anymore, he's really mad. And he's taking his anger and his hatred out on saints, believers. We know that... Uh, he was drunk on the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. He is the only true God and the only Savior. Jesus is. We know that to be true. So then, the enemy's wrath is toward those who will not follow him as 
their Savior. And we note then that John is left astonished with this scene. Okay? That's what the word admiration means. Our word admiration kind of leads to, oh, I admire, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in awe of, of them in a, in a good way, right? And so a better rendering of that word is astonishment, okay? Because I wouldn't think that John is going to look at this and go and be, and be like astonished with, with the devil and his ways, right? But I can kind of see how that all of this anger and this drunkenness with the saints' blood and everything would cause a great deal of astonishment in John's attitude. Um, we'll read this, I think, because we're going to link Daniel right in with Revelation when we're done here. But eventually, when we get to it in the book of Daniel, Daniel sees a vision and uh, this vision literally makes him sick. And he has to just go, to, he has to just take time out, take time off, go to bed because he is physically ill by what he has experienced. I would say that Daniel at that particular time could be described as being astonished by that vision, just as John was probably just completely astonished by what he was experiencing so that leads us into verse 7 the angel closes john's gaping mouth okay the angel closes john's gaping mouth because what happens when we're astonished at something usually we go oh, right and then somebody has to reach over and close our mouth right that's what the angel does that natural open mouth reaction might even of course be associated like i just showed you with a gasp verse 7 the angel said to me wherefore didst thou marvel i will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her which hath the seven heads and the ten horns so thankfully John does not have to stay in this posture because what's about to unfold is the woman is the false worship. The beast that's carrying the false worship is the Antichrist. We're going to put all this together. So a question is asked of John, why did you marvel? It doesn't seem he gets to answer this question, though. Um, the angel begins to explain what he is seeing even before he is able to answer. Got it? So a question is asked of John, However, the angel begins to explain what he is seeing even before John is able to answer the question. And so that leads us to verse 8 where we finish up tonight. And this is going to take just a little bit of time, so go ahead and know that we're not quite finished yet, with the confirmation from previous scenes. So what verse 8 is about to do for us is to build on what's already been spoken about. So you've got a little bit of room there. You might want to jot down a couple of references as we go through since we don't have any more lines to fill in. Okay, so we're going to see the confirmation from previous scenes. Verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet now is. <clears throat> okay. So um, 
Let me just also say this, that, uh, let's see, I don't have this in my notes. So, so I know one of the things that you're probably wondering is the seven hills and the ten horns and all of that, which we're going to get to deal with in the next message. Okay, but we will go ahead, I'll just leave that out there so that you'll know that we are going to deal with that. It's not just something I'm skipping over because it's too hard or anything like that. It's just something that we got to deal with in the next thing because, um, because it begins to all unfold. We, we begin to kind of see it more clearly in the next few verses. So right now what we get, though, in this verse is the confirmation from previous scenes. So, again, similar situations have already been experienced in our study. Okay, taking in mind... Verse 8, the beast that, was, that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Go back with me to Revelation 11 and verse 7. Revelation 11 and verse 7. Remember, this is where the two witnesses are there. And they are showing these great signs, and, and they are God's men. They are crying out, don't follow this guy. This guy's the man of sin. Don't uh, follow Jesus Christ. He is really the way, the truth, the life. They're witnessing. Anybody tries to come kill them, remember, fire blows out of their mouths and consumes them. I mean, these two guys are, are constantly in the corner of the uh, news feed on everything, social media and, and uh, CNN, Fox News, everything. They're everywhere. And uh, they make the news probably on an often basis because they also have the ability to turn water into blood. And so they just have these abilities to do these great things. And ultimately, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, man of sin hates these guys. And when the man of sin becomes the Antichrist, okay, verse 7 describes, when they shall have finished their testimony, the two witnesses, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Okay, so at the midpoint of the tribulation, that's when the man of sin is inhabited by the devil or a high-ranking demon, let's put it that way, from the bottomless pit. That's also not foreign to us because one of the the biggest judgments that happened on the earth was uh, there was the seal judgments and there was the trumpet judgments. Remember in the trumpet judgments when the bottomless pit was opened up and all of those demons came out that had long hair and snake tails. Do you remember those freaky things that came out? Well, guess where they ascended from? The bottomless pit. So this is literally, some people believe, an opening in the earth's surface that pops open and these things actually come out. Kind of weird, right? Everybody's talking about UFOs these days in the news. I'm a little bit more concerned about that hole in the earth. I don't know about you, but that's what really concerns me. So let's keep a cap on that thing for right now because that's awful. And so we know ultimately the demon that will possess uh, the man of sin, some people believe it will actually be Judas Iscariot. That's a weird one too. Never had heard that before till we were studying that a few weeks ago. But uh, <clears throat> uh, this demon that possesses the Antichrist um, is the one who is described there killing the two witnesses, but is also the one in the middle of the description here in verse 8 of chapter 17. So, again, the worst of all demons possesses Antichrist. He comes from the bottomless pit takes up residence in the man who is called the son of perdition. So jot this reference down, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. And flip over there if you want to. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. So again, we mentioned 2 Thessalonians just a little bit ago and chapter 2 about the Holy Spirit's influence. Well, we actually get a lot of information about this man of sin, the one who becomes Antichrist from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of 
perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, you compare that then with what verse 8 says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. So 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 is telling us that that is to come. This causes people, the people of the earth, that according to verse 8, their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the earth to wonder or admire him. Ultimately, they will worship him because of the fake revelation uh, fake resurrection all right and that's what the first part of verse 8 is talking about the beast that thou sawest was and is not and is again the end of the verse when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is and that also we have scripture verifying itself again because chapter 13 of Revelation told us that that was the situation. I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Again, we get to that in the next message. His horns, ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, mouth as the mouth of a lion. Dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast because of this staged death and resurrection. Just like Jesus died and raised from the dead so too will the man of sin go through this ultimate transformation into the antichrist okay and so he's the beast riding on the beast right now is all of the false worship from the inception of the world pretty much until the beast kicks her off and that's where chapter 17 continues to progress for us okay we all right with that everybody kind of following that pretty clearly okay okay good because this is uh this is stuff that's pretty kind of you know sci-fi-ish for sure. All right? So, Lord, uh, do help us to understand your word. Not so that we are super highly educated and can argue with the best of them about what's going to happen, but so that we will be warned and take the warning as necessary cause to be the witnesses you've caused us to be created us to be, called us to be. I pray that we will take your word and dwell on it, use it, and let it spark a, uh, an unction within us. We'll thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen.